Amen. Well, if you would take your Bibles with me and turn to the book of Psalms this evening, and we'll come to Psalm number 27. Psalm number 27. I'd like to begin by giving you really a bit of backstory of how God led me to this verse. We're going to be reading the whole psalm in a minute, but I'd like to focus tonight and just cover uh, verse number 13. I grew up in uh, Knoxville, Tennessee, under the ministry of Pastor Clarence Sexton in Temple at Temple Baptist Church. Uh, it's quite a large church. Uh, it was a church I was born into and raised, and um, the church uh, started a Crown College of the Bible, as they call it, and uh, eventually Crown College would branch off into the UK, which now we have Crown UK, where Peter's attending. And uh, Crown College is where myself and Jen, and actually Grady, uh, here tonight, uh, grad we all graduated from the college there. So it's one that's uh, <coughs> close to home for uh, many of us. And for many years, uh, the college uh, has every summer sent out a group of, tr of um, singing uh, groups. They would go, uh, it was usually uh, quartets or trios, and they would be sent out all across America uh, to go to churches, to minister, to preach, to sing. Uh, to go on outreach, help with kids' ministries, and to present the work of the college. And the idea was kind of to uh, be a blessing to churches, but also put the word out and encourage others to come to Crown College. And um, it's something they started for, for a, a long time ago. And back in 2004, a group of, of five uh, students at Crown there, uh, they were going to go out for the summer. And uh, before they went out to, to, to travel, um, what, what they usually have them sing and preach at the church before they send them out. So it was the night before they were to go out, and uh, there was a group of, of, of uh, men that were preaching that night. And uh, one of the men, uh, his name was Aaron Brown, and he was, going to, he was married. He was only 21 at the time. He was married to his wife, Darcy Brown, and uh, they were planning to go out and become uh, church planters in the northwest of America. But on that night before they went out, Aaron Brown preached, and uh, I had a habit when I was a little boy of whenever someone would preach, I would take my Bible to him and I'd ask him to sign it. It's uh, something I don't do today, I don't encourage today, because it's kind of weird, because you know authors sign their books and aren't the author of this book. Uh, most preachers would say, I'll write my name down as long as you promise to pray for me. So it's kind of a reminder for that. But you can see I brought tonight, this is, this is a Bible that's uh, very dear to me. This was a Bible that was given to me when I was seven years old. And uh, I've, I've had it for quite a long time now. And uh, I've got so many signatures in here from preachers. Most of them are, are gone now. Uh, most of these signatures are you know, 20 years old. Many, many of the names, they probably wouldn't mean much to you. But a lot of the names, I see faces and they mean a lot to me. And uh, on that night that Aaron Brown preached, um, I went up to him as a, as a, I believe I was a year old boy at the time, and I asked him to sign my Bible, and I got a signature uh, right there. The, the thing is, is that Aaron Brown, and, the, and he, he went out with his wife and a group of, of five students together, and uh, it wasn't long until they were on the road, and um, while they were traveling down the motorway, a lorry came and smacked him smack dead, right head on collision, and they were killed instantly, and the like, van went up in flames, their bodies were burnt to a crisp. They were unrecognizable. I believe they had to use dental records to recognize the bodies. It was tra tragic, absolutely tragic. Um, it's a, something that's kind of broken the hearts of the college and broken the heart of Pastor Sexton, obviously. It's something I think that affected them a lot. And they still they have a memorial at the college. If you go to visit, you'll find the memorial there. Um, but in the crash, there was one thing they found that survived the accident, and it was a <coughs> CD uh, that the college had made. And the CD, the title of it was God Makes No Mistakes. And uh, it was a witness, I believe, to, to that we're working at that we'll see and think, you know, how could something so tragic happen? But I think it was a, an assurance to the families knowing that it was of God, because God makes no mistakes. Amen. And you can imagine the impact that it had on young Samuel Pettit, a, a seven-year-old boy or eight-year-old boy at the time. And uh, I've, I've cherished the, the signature of Aaron Brown in my Bible because I didn't know that you, you, would, you would die very, very shortly. Uh, but it was only until recently I saw that it was the 18, I believe it was the 18-year anniversary of, of when they passed away. And I decided to go back and find my Bible 
example here, and find Aaron Brown's signature, and I looked at it, and I've never really looked at the verse that he wrote, wrote, wrote under his name. Most preachers, when they sign, they give a verse of encouragement, usually a life verse. But Aaron Brown wrote Psalm 27, verse number 13, and I decided to look it up in my Bible, and as I came to it and looked at Psalm 27, 13, um, I was a little bit confused at first, to be honest. I, I thought maybe he had missed uh, wrote what he meant to write, and that would be verse 14, which is a lot more well-known verse to many of us. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. But yeah, as I, as I started and focused on verse number 13, uh, I tell you, it's, it's so rich, and the Lord's really worked it over in my own heart and helped me a lot uh, recently as I've uh, had this verse come to mind. It's blessed me immensely. So I hope uh, that tonight as we look at this short verse, that your attention will be drawn to it, that you'll, uh, it's just a short little verse, uh, but I hope that, that you'll, you'll allow it to speak to you as uh, it has helped me immense, immensely. I hope it'll help you as well, and we'll just immerse <coughs> ourselves in this tonight. I, I really believe that it will, it will be a blessing to you. So let the, this verse, the verse that uh, Aaron Brown, a young preacher who died at the age of 21, let the verse that he wrote in my Bible let it be a blessing to you. As the Bible says in Hebrews, that no able, he being dead, yet speaketh. If you allow me to use the same terminology, really, Aaron Brown, uh, with this verse, he being dead, yet speaketh. And it, I believe it will minister to us all tonight. So let's go ahead and read the entire uh, psalm, just to get a bit of the uh, context and the whole picture of the psalm. Uh, but we'll just be focusing on verse 13 tonight. So Psalm chapter 27 and verse number 1. The Bible reads, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion, in the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me, he shall set me up upon a rock. And now shall mine head be lifted up, Above mine enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. When thou saidst, Seek ye my face. My heart said unto thee, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. Hide not thy face far from me. Put not thy servant away in, in anger. Thou hast been my help. Leave me not, neither forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies. Deliver me not over unto the will of mine enemies, for false witnesses are risen up against me, and such as breathe out cruelty. I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Heavenly Father, this evening, we thank you, Father, for your word. We thank you for the Psalms. What a blessing they are to us, Lord. And I pray that you'd help us now as we focus on this one little verse. Uh, that it will sink down into our hearts, Lord. It will be a verse that will help us in our Christian walk. It will help us, Lord, as we look at the times that, that bother us, the times that cause us to, to, to come to the brink of fainting, Lord. But may we uh, determine in our minds that we are going to be the ones that believe to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Thank you for all these things. And we ask that you please speak to us and be with us tonight, Lord. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a word in verse 13 that I'd like to draw your attention to that really is the key word of verse 13, and I've selected it as the title of tonight's message. It's the word unless. 
unless. The word only appears about eight times in the Bible. It's not very uh, uh, frequent in Scripture. It's a hard word to find. But God uses right here. It's a word that is uh, it's classified as a conditional negative conjunction. It, it is a word that you could, you could use another word for that probably more common to, for us to use, and that's the word accept. Accept. If you go to Isaiah chapter 1 and verse number 9, we find this word accept. In Isaiah 1 verse 9, it says, Except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom, and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. So Isaiah here is saying that, except the Lord of hosts left unto us a very small remnant. You know, if the Lord hadn't left unto us a very small remnant of people, we would have been like Sodom and like Gomorrah, where there would be no people. So he's basically saying, we would have been like Sodom and Gomorrah unless the Lord had left a small remnant. You could use the word except really um, here in verse 13 as well, if you would like, if you, if, to give you better understanding, I had fainted, except I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. If you were to change, you can, you can invert the clauses in this verse. I'm just, I'm just going to show you different ways of reading the verse to help you understand the importance of the word unless in the verse here. You could change the clauses and you could read it like this. You could say, unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, I would have fainted. Or if you were to remove the word unless and, and try to fill it in to make sense, you it would probably read something like this. If I had not believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, I would have fainted. I'm not trying to change the Bible or correct the Bible. As we talked about this morning, the Bible is perfect and without error. I'm just showing you that this word is very important. This word is the key word in the entire verse. The whole verse hinges upon the word unless. David is saying that if he had not had a determined change of mind in the middle of his faith, if he had not decided that he was going to believe that to see the goodness of God working in his life in the land of the living, the Bible says there, if God was working in his life that he would see, he says, I would have fainted. I would have failed. And Christian, I, I believe perhaps for you and, and your Christian walk, the difference between you failing and fainting and you staying at it and staying faithful could be the difference of the unless, unless you had chosen to believe to see God's goodness. Just a few points, a very brief message I have to draw uh, out of this verse. The first thing is we see those three words, I had fainted. We see David's desperate condition. I had fainted. He was on the brink of fainting. Now, we don't know the circumstances surrounding this psalm. Uh, as you read through it, and our pastor actually preached the message over lockdown called A Psalm for the Stressed, where he covered verses 1 to 6. This is a psalm where David seems very stressed, very distressed. And he's feeling like though his enemies, the wicked, are, are crowding around him, and he, he feels so helpless, and he feels like he's got no strength. He feels like he's overwhelmed. We don't know exactly what David's trouble was at this, at this time. The Bible doesn't give us any context. So, some have speculated that perhaps this was when David was running from cave to cave from Saul and his armies trying to, you know, just preserve his life. He was afraid he was going to die, maybe. That's when David decided to, to, read the, or to write the psalm. Maybe it was when Absalom, his son, uh, he rebelled and was overthrowing David as king. Maybe it was one of those events. We don't know, but we do know that David was in a time of trouble. He, was, he mentions that in verse 5, for in the time of trouble, David was in a time of trouble, and he felt like his enemies were crowding around him. He felt like everything was going wrong, and he was on the brink of fainting. He was on the brink of giving up. There are times when we feel faint in the Christian life. What, is it, what does it mean to, to feel faint? It's a, you know, we, we say, you know, I had fainted. Literally, we associate that with passing out and falling over. It's not too far off the meaning. When you feel faint, when the Bible says here that David said he felt faint, it's a feeling of, of weakness, a feeling of feebleness, a feeling like you've got all this pressure on top of you and your, your knees are buckling and you're about to just give away. You're about to just break. 
It says if you were to pull a rope and you're putting tension and tension and tension on it, and that rope starts unwinding and breaking, and there's one little strand left. It's on the brink of fainting. It's on the brink of disaster. And that's what David is feeling. He's feeling like he's about to faint. The Bible says that, it gives this word often in Scripture about feeling faint. It says that when Esau came back from the field, he said that he felt very faint. And uh, it says that he, what he ended up doing was his birthright just to get some, some, some food so that he could re restore his strength and his nourishment. You know, he wouldn't something so serious as his birthright, and he sold it. He wouldn't do that if he didn't, you know, if he just had a tummy ache or if he just felt a little bit. No, he, was, he felt like he was about to die. He was so desperate for food. He sold his birthright because he felt faint. Daniel chapter 8, if you want to turn there with me, Daniel talks about a time when he felt faint. And it helps us understand what it means to feel like you're on the brink of fainting. Daniel chapter 8 and verse number 26. This is after uh, God had given him the, uh, the vision of the ram and the, the goat and the little horn. You remember all this vision that we covered in our Daniel Bible study. In Daniel chapter 8 verse uh, 26 it says, In the vision of the evening and the morning which was told is true, Wherefore, shut thou up the vision, for it shall be for many days. And look what happens after this vision is given to Daniel. It says, And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick certain days. Afterward, I rose up and did the king's business, and I was astonished at the vision. But none understood it. Can you imagine if God came to you and gave you all this prophecy about uh, the, 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 these beasts and the rams and the... And it's so overwhelming. I mean, first of all, you got God speaking to you. How how overwhelming that would be. I mean, that would that would make you you want to have you ever had that feeling where you feel really small? You ever get in a room with someone really intelligent and really you know they start saying things and you're suddenly like, I actually don't know many things. I feel a little bit intimidated. I mean, imagine what it must be like when God starts revealing these visions to Daniel, when God starts revealing this truth and you're in a room with God, imagine how small that would make you feel. It was so overwhelming, so, so, uh, but then trying to comprehend the meaning of these visions. He knew they had severe ramifications. Perhaps you know, there's things Daniel said that he didn't understand and no one understood because, understand because the book is sealed until a certain time. But Daniel here says that he had all this vision, he had all this revealed to him for him to, to communicate. And he says, and I, Daniel, fainted and was sick certain days. He didn't just, you know, sit down, take a breather, and get back up. No, he was, he was, he fainted, and he was sick, sick to his stomach. Certain days, he was unable to get back to get get out of bed. He was unable to lift himself out of bed. He fainted. And David, in Psalm twenty-seven, I believe he was on the brink of that, right on the edge of about to faint, about to give up, about to be sick for many days. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 29. giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increases strength. So God is, uh, is giving a parallel here, saying that those that, have, um, that are faint, those are the ones that have no might. It says that he giveth power to the faint, he, he gives them power, gives them strength, and he, that to them that have no might, he increases their strength. So he's giving, telling you that those that are faint are those that have no might, they have no strength, there's no energy in their body. You ever been there where uh, perhaps after you've run a long while or perhaps after you haven't had any food or you've been hiking or perhaps, uh, I don't know, you've been doing some kind of physical exercise, you get to the point where you literally have no more energy in your body. You just can't even move it. Uh, I was there recently. I, we were uh, at work. We were um, putting in a concrete bed, and all day long, it was, it was that week we had a, a heat wave. So I was working out just outside, and we had about, I think, 18 tons or something of materials that I had to shovel uh, into the back of a trailer, get all the way up to the top of the hill and shovel it back out. All day long, those shoveling and shoveling and shoveling. And by about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, those shovels, they were really heavy. I mean, I was struggling to get it up. I had no strength in me. I had no might in me. And I believe it's the same thing. When you feel faint, when you feel uh, so helpless and you have, no, you, you have no strength, you are unable to carry on. You're able, unable to lift yourself up. Feeling faint is a feeling uh, where you feel you're weak. You feel like you're sick. It's a horrible feeling. It's a feeling of, of 
being feeble, of being depressed, of distressed, demoralized, dispirited. You pick the word. It's a feeling where really it all boils down to fear. Because when you faint, when you have no strength, you're unable to, to fend for yourself. You have no strength when you've worn out all your breath and all of your energy. If the devil comes your way, you have nowhere to run because you, he'll outrun you every day of the week. You're faint. And I believe David was at this point of feeling fearful. He had well, he had fainted. He was on the brink of fainting, on the brink of giving in, of giving up. That's the feeling of feeling so helpless and so hopeless that he had no mind. It's a feeling that really I, I think I only had have experienced really once in my life. I mean, maybe it was a few other times I think I've experienced. But the only time I can really remember feeling faint was when Leland was born. Uh, when we went to, to the hospital, obviously, it was, it was a lot of drama, I'm sure most of you heard about. But that feeling of when, when we were in the hospital and they're trying to get her into labor and uh, suddenly the baby's heart rate is dropping and it starts stopping. We don't know what's going on. And Jen is in pain and she's unable to breathe because of the pain and they're, they're, they're stabbing things in her left and right and there's blood going everywhere and there's uh, they're shifting her body to try to ease the pain and try to get her breath back and the baby's heart rate was dropping and it kept going out and they kept losing it and it was chaos there was doctors flooding the rooms nurses flooding the rooms Jen couldn't breathe Layland's uh, uh, heart rate was stopping and uh, suddenly they say the doctor says we got to take her into surgery now so they all all of them just rushed out the door and a nurse on the way out turned to me and said we'll come get you if you're allowed to come in and said you stay stay put so you can imagine, it's absolute chaos for one minute. Doctor's coming in, the heart rate monitor is dropping, they're losing their heart rate, Jen can't breathe. Suddenly they say, we've got to go to surgery now, and they all rush out the door, and I'm stood in this room where all that just happened, and having no idea what's going to happen, no idea what, I, I thought I was going to lose both of them. I thought I was, I, I was so fearful, I was so uh, 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 lost, and so feeling so helpless, and so, so, so hopeless. I didn't know what was going to happen. I couldn't, I remember specifically, I couldn't stand down because my body just felt so weak and crumbling. I felt like my vision was closing in. I had to sit down and put my hands in my face. And I tell you, I've, I've never prayed like I prayed that in that moment. I've never cried like I cried in that moment. I've never felt so faint as I did in that moment. And I believe that was David's desperate condition. He experienced that same feeling where he says, I had fainted. I was right on the brink of faintness. Perhaps, Christian, you've experienced that same desperate condition of feeling faint. Maybe it was when you or a loved one received some bad news from the doctor. Maybe it was when some unforeseen circumstance came your way. Imagine the families of, of these students that died in this car crash. Imagine the feelings that must have been coming to them as they heard that, you know, fathers and mothers and sisters and brothers heard that their, their, their loved ones weren't ever going to come home again. That they died instantly. They'd never see their face again. They wouldn't even be able to give them really a proper burial because their bodies were burnt to a crisp. How tragic. Imagine the feelings that they must have gone through. Thank you. I'm sure most of you have, have, have felt a little bit of this faintness. And if not in, in life, I believe you'll probably come to, to feeling this faintness. Maybe you, you're feeling overwhelmed or helpless. And you're wondering what is going to happen in the future. You have no idea. You're faint. What should you do? Well, you should do exactly what David did, which is really the only thing you can do in a time like that. And that is look to the Lord. David, he didn't stay, he didn't give in to the faintness. He didn't cave in and allow it all to come crumbling down. He says, I would have fainted unless. In David's faintness, he decided to look to God. First, we saw David's desperate condition. Second, we see David's determined consideration. Unless. In the midst of David's trouble, when he was on the brink of fainting, he decided that he would not give up. He would not give in. He would stop and consider what God was trying to do in this moment. He would stop and say, hold on, let's take a step back. All of this is happening. 
And I feel so faint, but yet I know that God must have a purpose in it all. Go to Ecclesiastes real quick. Ecclesiastes chapter 7. There's a really good verse here. In Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 7, verse number 14. In Ecclesiastes chapter 14. Actually, let's go back to verse 13 because it's another good verse. He says, consider the work of God. For who can make that who can make that straight which he hath made crooked? It's always an interesting verse to me. God's, he said uh, that God, his work is, is sometimes making things crooked. Now it doesn't mean he's making any things wicked or sinful. Often we associate the word crooked with it's not right, it's not normal. But yet he says, Who can make what straight what God has made crooked? So sometimes God intentionally makes things crooked. And oftentimes in the Christian life, you want to get to point A to B, but God says, oh, no, 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 the road is sometimes a bit windy and a bit up and down. And Solomon says here, consider God's work. But watch this in verse 14. We're talking about in a time of trouble, in a time where you're about to feel faint. He says, in the day of prosperity, be joyful. But in the day of adversity, consider. So when we're in the day of prosperity, when God is blessing and things are going great, we're to be joyful. We're to praise God and thank God for all that he's done. We're to rejoice in the Lord. But he says, but in the day of adversity, the day of adversity, the days when things don't go our way, the contrary winds come across our lives, the times where we feel like everything is caved in, we're about on the brink of, faint, of fainting, instead of giving into that, instead of being so wrapped up in all that, he says, in the day of adversity, consider. Stop and think. Stop and meditate. Stop and consider. In other words, I believe here what God is saying is that adversity is his classroom. Adversity is when God is teaching. It's when God wants you to learn. And he says here, in the day of adversity, we need to consider. We need to stop and consider. Stop being so focused on the things that are causing us to faint. We need to step back and start considering and looking at how is God working in this? Because we know that God is working in it. God is working in all of it. In Hebrews chapter 12, if you want to turn there uh, just briefly, Hebrews chapter 12. We're not just to stand back and to look and to consider what is happening and what is going on and uh, the circumstances and see how that connects to that. And we're not just to look at those things. No, we're to stop and to consider Christ. Look at what it says in uh, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 3. He says, watch well, look at verse 2. It says, looking into Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against themselves, lest ye be weary and faint in your minds. And that's the phrase there that the writer says here. He says, lest ye be weary and faint in your minds. In other words, he's saying, again, kind of, kind of saying the same thing as David. You could say, He's saying, you know, you will faint, you will be weary in your minds unless you consider Christ that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. You will be faint in your minds. You will be weary unless you look to Christ and consider him. The key to not giving into that faintness and not fainting and not being weary in troubling times is by considering Christ. Why is that? Why well, believe? Because when you look to Christ, when you look at the things that he endured and the things that he suffered, our sufferings pale in comparison. Our sufferings are not even, don't even come close to the sufferings that Christ went through. The things that Christ endured make the things that we have to endure look like, like child's play. In the times of trouble, in the times of fainting, we need to can stop and have a determined consideration that we are going to look to Christ. We're going to consider him. We're going to consider how is God working in this situation? How is God working in all this? How working in our adversity? And then we look to Christ and say, well, Christ endured all that. I can endure as well. David, he says, I had fainted. He had a, uh, he had a desperate condition. 
Then he says, unless, so he had a determined consideration. And lastly, David had a devoted confidence. He says, unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. David had a change of mind where he had to decide to get his eyes off of his enemies. He had to decide to get his eyes off of all the circumstances, all the things that were happening that were causing him to faint. He had a change of mind, get, get his mind off of his problems, and start looking to see God's goodness in all of that. It's really hard to do. When you have all the things that are going on, you see all the bad things that are happening, you don't want to start looking for the positive thing, things, looking for the, the, the things that God could be doing. Now we're so wrapped up in what's happening, and I can't believe that happened, and this has happened, and woe is me. But yet, we need to stop and see that God is working. God is working in all of it. Notice what he says here. He says that he, he had fainted unless he had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. He had a hopeful faith that said, I don't know how, but somehow, some way, God is going to work something good out of all this. God is going to work something good. I'm going to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Notice the phraseology here. It says, unless I have believed to see. Unless I had believed to see. We often, you know, say you know, with things, well, you know, I'll believe it when I see it. If me were to say to me, I can bench 200, uh, you know, pounds or what is it, kilos? <laughs> I don't know what the conversion rate is. If you say, I could bench a lot of weight, I'd say, well, I'll believe that when I see it. You know, we say, we say things like that. I'll believe it when I see it. But for God's work in our lives, we need to believe to see it. We need to believe in order that we are, that we are going to see it. That God is going to work. This isn't just, uh, you know, uh, 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 a wishful thinking, a thing that, well, I think God might do something. No, this is a devoted confidence and knowing that God is working and I am going to see some good out of this that God is working. Unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. This is not the power of positive thinking as many uh, have have fallen heir to. This is the power of acknowledging. This is this is the, the uh, us acknowledging God's power in our thinking. This is us looking for God to work. We're acknowledging that uh, God is going to work. He has the power. He is working in this situation. This is not us just wishfully thinking and thinking things are going to get better. And if we will it strong enough, it's going to get right. And I just have to be strong and have to will. No, this is believing to see God's goodness. We know that God is going to bring goodness out of this. Look at what it says in the end of the verse. He says, believe to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Sometimes you hear Christians say, you know, come, come with this mindset that everything in this earth is all sinful and wicked and evil. There's no goodness in it whatsoever. I just can't wait till I go home to glory and finally perfection will happen. Finally, we'll have all the goodness of the Lord. In other words, their mindset is everything in this earth is evil and we have to endure all this evil until we get to heaven and then we get to experience the goodness of the Lord. But David says here, no, I believe to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. In other words, God is working now. God is working here. God is working in my life. God is working in the world, and I can see it. I can believe that he is going to work. It's here on earth, and you will miss it. I promise you, you'll miss seeing God's goodness working out through all circumstances if you weren't believing that you're going to see it, if you're not looking for it. Romans chapter 8, very familiar verses for, for all of us here tonight. But it's really speaking of the exact same thing. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse number 26. It says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. What an encouraging verse.
know that the, the Holy Spirit is making intercession for you. The Bible says in another part of Scripture that Jesus is making intercession for you. In other words, Jesus is praying for you. Let me ask you, do you think Jesus gets his prayers answered? You better believe it. Jesus is praying for you in the middle of all of your trouble and all of your fainting. Just remember that Jesus is praying for you. But look what he goes on to say in verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good. To them that, are, that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. And we know, we know that all things work together for good. And so that's the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. That's that con devoted confidence. We know, I believe to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. The circumstances, they may not change. The, 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 the things that are, that are weighing down on you, they may not be removed. But you can have that change of mind where you say, even though I'm on the, all these things are weighing down and they're pressuring me and I feel like I'm about to faint, you can have that determined consideration where you say, hold on, unless, unless I decide I'm going to have this devoted confidence in God that I believe and I know that God is working something through this. God is working the goodness, his goodness in the land of the living. One more verse, Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. Galatians chapter 6 and verse number 9. Galatians chapter 6, verse 9, it says, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. We shall reap if we faint not. If you give in to the fainting, if you give in to everything that is weighing you down, the Bible says here, you're not going to reap because you fainted. But if we want to reap the things that we're sowing, first of all, you have to sow. <laughs> and you have to keep sowing. But if you want to see the fruit, if you want to reap the harvest, the Bible says here, we have to faint not. We have to be like David who says, we're not, even though I'm on the brink, and even though I, I would have fainted, he says here, I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. How do you keep from fainting? You have to have this determined consideration that in the middle of all the things that are weighing you down in your desperate condition, you have to decide that you're going to consider. In the day of, of adversity, consider. Realize that God is trying to teach you something. Consider Christ who endured such comfort. Uh, uh, contradiction of sinners. And we have to have this devoted confidence in God that we are going to see God's goodness in the land of the living. We know that God worketh all things together for good. You have to believe that you're going to see it in the land of the, li of the living. Not that you're going to get to heaven and understand it all and it won't be correct. No, in the land of the living, in your life. You're going to see God work in your life, in your world, in, the ch in our church. We have to not give up. It's a hard place to minister. It's a hard day to minister. It's a hard day to serve the Lord. You know, faith, we have adversity on every side. We're constantly battling uh, the devil, the flesh. We're constantly battling the world that is, uh, that is in direct contradiction to God and his word. We're, we're in a battle. And if we're, if, we, if we're not careful, we might decide that we're going to give in. All this pressure, all these things that are coming up on about us, we're going to faint. But if we want to see God work, friends, if we want to see God work, because God is working, we have to decide we are going to believe to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Amen? Let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer. Father, we come to you this evening. We thank you for your word, Lord. Thank you that David, in this verse, Lord, a, a, a verse that has really never caught my attention at all. But Lord, I pray that tonight it's been a blessing to us all. I pray that you'd help us, Lord, not to give in to the fainting. May we not be the ones that say, I did faint. But may we be the ones that say, I would have fainted 
if I had not decided I was going to see, believe to see God's goodness in my life. We, Father, help us all to recognize that you are working and you're going to perform the work which you, which you began. You're going to see it to its finish. May we acknowledge your work, Lord. May we be looking for your work. May we just rest in the promises of knowing that you are working all things together for good. Father, we love you. I pray that you apply these things to our hearts now. Help us to live them out. Uh, and apply them now, Lord, and uh, that you make us better Christians for it and make us uh, more like Christ and better fit for heaven. Thank you for all these things and ask them in Jesus' name. Amen.